Good morning, Cornerstone. And our Facebook friends who are viewing and worshiping with us, good morning to you as well. As we come and settle, I'd like for you to stand, please, for the reading of the scripture. I will be reading from the book of Psalm 91, the first four verses. And they read, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You, let us pray. But before I do, I'd just like to do a little expounding on the verse. You know, God is our refuge. He is the covering like the feathers of a bird as a bird wings cover the baby chicks. When we go through trouble and heartache, we can face them without fear as long as our face is turned toward God. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we bow before you this morning, thanking you for another day. For this is the day, Lord God, that you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We want to thank you this morning for loving us so, Father God. We put our hope and expectations in you. You know all about us, Lord, because you created us in your image and your likeness. And only you can give us the strength, the courage, and the wisdom that we need to meet the challenges of today's life. Give us the courage, Father, to show ourselves strong in the face of pain and grief. During disappointment and heartache, Lord God, hallelujah, Help us to turn to you for the stability and the comfort we need. During life's temptation, Lord God, help us not to lose our way and have the courage to do what is right in your sight. Open our eyes that we may see, see the injustices of our hurting nation, our hurting world. Father God, so much is happening today. And Lord God, I know that we need to just continue to look to you because you created us. You know what is going on and only you, Lord God, can bring it to an end, the situation that the world is in today. Father God, give us, give our leaders the courage to work together to bring our nation and other nations together. And Lord, give us a greater vision of what you would have us to be. Your word, Lord God, reminds us, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Lord God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. New mercies every morning. And as we forge ahead, our Father, we thank you for the promise and the hope embedded in your word. And we look forward to the expectancy and faith for you, Lord God, who holds the key to all things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, 
We pray that you would just take charge of today's service. Lord God, let your train fill this temple, Lord God. Let us look only to you. Anything we brought in here that is not of you, Lord God, I pray that they will park it at the door and not bring it inside the sanctuary. But Lord God, we only want to worship you in here this morning. And Father, we love you. Many times we don't know how to come to you with the things of life. But Lord God, you know what we are thinking before we even say any words. Lord, as we just let your spirit flow in us, let it flow to the point that it will be available, not just for ourselves, but it will be a benefit for others. And we give you honor. We give you glory. We adore you. We lift you up. We give, put our hand in your hand because your hand is a strong hand that we can trust. I love you, Lord. And I pray that you bless each and every one that is here this morning and those that are on their way and those that are watching on their media equipment. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory, hallelujah. Come on and let's just give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He is worthy of all praise, all glory, and all honor. Hallelujah. We have entered into his midst one more time to lift up the name of Jesus. For he is worthy. Hallelujah. We bless him on this morning. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on and bless him with me this morning. Come on, hallelujah. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. No other, no other name I know. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. No other, no other name I know. There is joy in the name of Jesus. So much joy in the name of Jesus, there is joy in the name of Jesus, no other, no other name I know, and there is healing in the name of Jesus, there is healing in the name of Jesus, there is healing in the name of Jesus, no other, no other name I know. In the name of Jesus, we got peace in the name of Jesus. We got peace in the name of Jesus. No other name, no other name I know. And you've got power in the name of Jesus. You've got power in the name of Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus, no other, no other name I know, and there is victory in the name of Jesus. We got victory in the name of Jesus. We got victory in the name of Jesus, no other, no other name I know. Wonderful name of Jesus. Why don't you bless, bless 
bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. No other name I know. Why don't you bless that wonderful name of Jesus? Come on and bless, bless that, that wonderful name of Jesus. Why don't you bless, bless that, that wonderful name of Jesus? No other, no other name. Hallelujah. There's no other name than the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. His name is wonderful. His name is marvelous. His name is glorious. Let's just call that name Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. What a wonderful name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name. Hallelujah. Join with me. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance. Fragrance after the rain. Come on, I'll call his name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven, let all heaven and the
Jesus. 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 There's just something. Hallelujah. Continue to give God praise. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name, God. There is something about the name of Jesus. Father, we lift you up on high. Lord, we lift you up on high. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, we just thank you and praise you for this day. It is the day that you have made. We rejoice and we're glad in it. We magnify you. We thank you, Lord God, for this season and time of prayer, this time of reading and studying of your word, which is always a part of our lives, and a time, Lord God, of fasting, where, Lord God, we have submitted our hearts and our minds and our lives to you. We thank you, God, today for the effect of fasting, of spiritual sensitivity, a heightened awareness of who you are in our lives, clarity of, of vision, clarity, Lord God, of thought clarity of even being able to hear what the spirit is saying to the church we thank you lord god for the spiritual benefits of fasting and prayer development of our spiritual man maturity as we've overcome many obstacles and many hindrances lord god that would normally hold us we ask that you would help us to sustain the growth that we uh, obtained during this time we ask lord god that you by your spirit would help us to step up on and build upon this moment in time that we would not Lord God become lesser than we are now but we would become greater in you we thank you for the physical benefits that we've experienced some Lord God our bodies are different because we have minimized some of the intake of things that normally would be uh, pleasing to us but negative to our body in other words things that we would normally consume that Lord God we decided to fast and so as a result Lord God our bodies are functioning better weight loss is tra weight loss has transpired we lord god are are clear in our thinking our blood flow and our blood uh, is better because of it god our hearts and our stomachs our physical bodies lord god have increased because fasting has benefits as well and we thank you for those benefits but most of all lord god we thank you that our relationship with you has been fortified and strengthened we thank you, Jesus, for being our father. We thank you for being our friend, our brother. We thank you, God, for being the father. And Jesus, for being, for being our savior and our Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just give him praise in your own heart. Think about how awesome he is in your life.
that you would just bless your people now as we enter into a time Lord God of adoration and focus on you as the worship has opened up the place of your entrance because your word says you inhabit the praise of your people we welcome you into our presence God we thank you Lord God for being a very present help in the time of need and I ask Lord God that you would just bless and bestow tremendous blessing upon your people today as we engage Lord God in fellowship as we engage in your word as we become Lord God more complete in our relationship with you for it is your word that says if we abide in you and you abide in us we shall be one and we thank you Lord God that abiding means to commit to interact with to submit to we submit to you Lord we interact with you we engage with you today and every day Lord God we thank you that every every heart would be whole that our hearts would be made whole because out of the heart flows the issues of life. We thank you, Lord God, that out of our hearts also flow the words of our thoughts. For out of our own heart, our mouths do speak. We thank you that our words are going to coincide with and align with your truth. God, we bless you and praise you. We thank you and adore you. 
for giving us the opportunity to come before your throne boldly that we might obtain mercy and find favor in our time of need. Help us to go beyond, Lord God, the church experience with you, but to be in relationship with you, to know you and to be known, to love you as you've loved us first, to engage with you, Lord God, and never to uh, allow ourselves to be convinced that you are not there for us but that you are always there for us even until the end of the age now we ask for everyone's health health lord god health to be healed their health to be healed heal them lord god touch them lord god every physical condition that might exist touch it lord god every mental challenge lord god where we're dealing with great uh, awareness in this hour that we live in for mental health we pray god for mental health that minds would be stable that minds would be calm and whole. We pray, Lord God, that men and women would rest in you and that their peace, Lord God, would be coming from you, the peace of God that passes understanding, that they would not, Lord God, yield to the pressure of life that would cause them to be unstable and imbalanced, but that their health would be strong, that their minds would be strong, that their emotions would be stable in you that you would give us all stability. So touch us in our mental health, God. Touch our children and their mental health. Children are exposed to things that we were never exposed to as children, many of us. God, children are acting in this way, uh, in ways, Lord God, now, as a result of things they've been exposed to. Children are carrying guns and shooting guns, having deliberate plans to hurt people. Children, Lord God, are being exposed, Lord God, to violence on television, through games, in our community, on the television. They're seeing police brutality. They're seeing school brutality and violence. They're seeing domestic violence on an increase in our homes. Lord God, children are experiencing a great deal of pressure. We pray for this generation that's coming, God, that they would have a foundation in you. That when they grow old, they will not depart from it. And if they do not have it in their homes, I pray, Lord God, that they would be in a Sunday school class or in a children's church ministry or in a student ministry in some place on this planet that would be nurturing them, causing them to grow. That they would be in activities in their schools and activities in the community that would bless them and cause them to grow in the things of God. We ask, Lord God, that you would cover our children because they are under a great attack. We ask, Lord God, right now that you would encamp around about our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. We ask, Lord God, that you would undergird them and give them a foundation so that they would have a bright tomorrow, a future, Lord God, that they can look forward to, a world that is not controlled by evil or darkness or violence or crime, Lord God, or injustice or inequity, but a future, Lord God, that is founded in you, one that is stable where the government is still yet known to be upon your shoulders and the world is still under your control for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell there is are our children Lord God are blessed we bestow blessing upon them even before they know what a blessing is we speak into their future Lord God we speak into their future we firm up and secure their present Lord God and we ask that you would heal them of their past anything Lord God that is holding them anything Lord God that would come against them to make them feel less than that would pervert their thinking Lord God that would cause them to be overly concerned about things that are irrelevant and unnecessary we pray Lord God for our babies for our children that they would be blessed and rise up and call to call their mothers blessed to rise up and know their fathers that you would turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and Lord God that the children would honor their mother and their father that their days might be long on this earth God we destroy the work of the enemy Satan we as believers come against you the Bible says this kind of evil only come out by fasting and praying will be served notice today devil that this August body of believers has fasted is fasted and we're praying and this kind hey, shall come out by fasting and prayer devil you are a liar devil you are defeated devil you are overthrown in the name of of Jesus yea the power of the Holy Spirit be against you the will of the Father shall be done on earth as it is in heaven this day Satan your hands are bound 
Your will is bound. Your plan is bound. We are the children of God. Now, we are the powerful in the earth. We are the light of the earth, the salt of the earth. All dominion and authority has been given into our hands. Wherever our feet feet trod, we shall possess. Whatever we call down shall come down. Whatever we bind shall be bound. Whatever we loose shall be loosed. Whatever we give shall be received. Whatever we say shall come to pass. For we call those things that be not as though they were. Freedom over our children. Freedom over our families. Freedom over our community. Freedom over our homes. Freedom over our marriages. Freedom in the name of Jesus. For whom the sun sets free is free indeed. The power of the Holy Ghost, the authority of the Holy Ghost to change a life, to set a life on the right path. In the name of Jesus, I want every warrior of God to say, I bind you, devil. Bind him up. I bind you, devil. Bind him up. I bind you, devil. Wherever he exists, we bind him. We bind you. We release. We release. We release. Somebody say it with me. I release life in my family. I release life down to every generation. I release life down to every generation. I release it up to every generation before me. I release life in my family. Life in that more abundantly. Life. Life. Life, 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 life consists of everything you do mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and financially. Everything you do in those dimensions, spiritually, also relationally, everything will be alive in you now. Everything will be alive in us. Alive, not dead, alive, alive. Your ideas will come alive. Your words will be life and not death. Remember the Bible says the power of both what life and death are in the tongue. You're going to speak life over you first. As a matter of fact, I want everybody just, you don't have to do it, but if you want to symbolically just to lay your hand on your heart and say life is in my heart. Life is in my heart. Life is in my heart. And because there's, because there's life in my heart. Somebody say this, because there's life in my heart, there's life in my mouth. My words bring life. My words bring life. That's right. When you speak, there's going to be life in your house now because many of us have spoken death over ourselves and to each other. And that's a lie from the devil. We're not going to any longer speak death to one another. We're going to speak life to one another. I don't have to like you to speak life to you. I can speak life to you in spite of my feelings towards you. Life, speaking life is not predicated upon a good relationship. You don't have to have a perfect relationship to speak life. You can speak life to dark things. In other words, you can call those things out of darkness and bring them into light. You just have to decide by faith and choose God's will over your own will. I believe it was Jesus that said, not my will, but thy will be done. I believe it was David that said, take me to a rock that's higher than I. I believe it was Paul that said, not that I have obtained, but that one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high call. I believe it's that you and I that say, no longer in my will, but God's will. Let's say it, no longer my will, but God's will. No longer my will, but God's will. No longer my will, but God's will. So I will speak life over my, over my situations. I'm not broke. I'm on, my, I'm on my way to being rich. You're not broke. Stop saying you're broke. You're not broke. You're not broke. You just haven't made some changes yet. You just, ha just haven't adjusted some things yet. Stop living in an Instagram mystery, an Instagram a fantasy. In other words, you watch Instagram. I know we got some young people here. You all in Instagram. I love it too. But you get on there, you see the Bugattis and the trips to Dubai and the private jets and all that stuff. Well, those things are only a few decisions away for everybody. And I'm not saying you need to do all that. I'm just saying that's what people marvel at. People like palatial things. People like shopping in Paris and, and going to New York on a shopping spree. Nothing wrong with living a life that's fulfilled. But my point is that that is not the ultimate goal. But any of that is only one word or one decision, one strategy away from you. Stop living beneath your privilege is what I'm saying. But be content wherever you find yourself. Don't look at those things and get depressed. Come on, somebody. Don't be watching everybody else's life and then hate your life. 
Don't look at somebody else's hair and hate your hair. Don't look at somebody else's skin and hate your skin. Don't look at someone else's education and hate your education. Love you. Somebody say, I love myself. Come on. We need some people that love themselves on this planet. I'm tired of people who are not really loving themselves but trying to live up to somebody else's standard. Trying to wear somebody else's brand name to make themselves feel comfortable. I don't need a pair of Jordans on to feel successful. Come on, somebody. I don't need some Balenciagas. I don't need to wear all the name brands to feel successful. You need to be successful before you put anything on your body. You need to know who you are before you go out and buy any kind of car. All the brands that they got out there, all the Benz's and the Mercedes and the Audis and, the, and, and all the Rolls Royce, all that stuff, the Bentleys, that stuff means nothing if you're not whole. I remember, remember a great football player. They won the Super Bowl. He's a born-again believer now. His name is Deion Sanders. And, and he bought this car, an expensive Lamborghini, and he went and, and he crashed it into a tree after winning the Super Bowl because he said with all the trappings that he had, he was still empty on the inside. Now, you know, he just left from Jackson State and now he's at Colorado, but he's a Christian. He loves the Lord. And he insists that people around him know that he loves the Lord and he ain't hard to find, he says. And so therefore, I'm going to say to you, you can own everything. But, but what does it profit a man to gain, to gain the whole world but lose his own soul? I mean, what does it profit you if you got everything that anybody could ever want, but you don't love yourself and you're thinking about putting a gun in your mouth? You're thinking about putting a gun to your head? Come on, somebody. We need God to allow, we need to allow rather God to, to move us into a new dimension of understanding about humanity. Humanity is not built on stuff. It's built on knowing the God who made all the stuff and knowing him. And when you know him, the Bible says, seek him first and his kingdom and his righteousness. And he'll add all things, all stuff to you. But don't go after the stuff and miss your God. Don't go after, don't go after the created and miss the creator. Don't go after the temporary and miss the eternal. Stand firm in the word and God will make everything good. How many of you know that God will do good things? The Bible says that God gives good gifts and he adds no sorrow to it. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variableness or shadow of turning. God changes not. When it concerns you, God is going to bless you big. God concerning his people, he is not going to do you less than you can ever imagine or think or dream. Stop looking forward to some other source. Look for it from God. God will give you the direction. He'll give you the strategy. He'll tell you when. He'll tell you who. He'll tell you what. He'll open up the doors. He'll provide every resource. He'll provide every connection. He'll provide every decision. But you got to believe him. You got to believe him. And believing him, let me tell you this, believing him don't come easy and it ain't cheap. It's going to cost you something. You're going to have to lay down your life in order to pick up his. You're going to have to change your mind in order to take on the mind of Christ. But at the end of it, I'm going to tell you this. Every last one of you are going to live further into the future. Watch this. When I say you're thinking, further into the future than you ever have. You're going to begin to see things and understand things that you never understood before. You're going to see further into the future. Why? Because God's going to reveal it by his spirit. So that you can get prepared for what's coming. So that you can know, even as you're known. The Bible says no, even as you know, once we get to heaven, now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, we'll know even as we're known. But even before we see him face to face, now we can know things. Because God will reveal them by his spirit. Eyes have not seen, what? Ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has, what? Prepared for his people, but it's been, what? Revealed by, what? The spirit. God will show you things to come. There's nothing hidden from God. Your future is revealed in God. Your prosperity is revealed in God. Your aspirations, Elder Trina, are revealed in God. The thing that God's been showing you is going to happen. It's happening sooner than you think. The thing that you expect is going to happen when you see it in God. The thing that you are longing for, the thing that you are desiring for, the thing that you've been waiting for, wait patiently on the Lord. And when you wait on him, he'll show you. When you wait on him, he'll reveal it. But he's going to show you into the future and he's going to tell you to do some crazy stuff like build an ark when nobody else ain't paying no attention. You see what I'm saying? He's going to tell you to leave your country. In other words, come out of your comfort zone, Abraham, and leave what is familiar and go into some unfamiliar. In other words, some of you are all about to buy some apartment complexes. Listen to me. 
You're not going to do it by yourself. You have to team up with some people and create a group. And you're going to buy some property. I hear the Holy Spirit. And you will come out of just barely owning your own place and owning other things. Why? Because there's power in unity. So stop trying to do it based on your own credit and your own knowledge and your own wherewithal. No man is an island. Learn to team up. Learn to partner up. Have an agreement when you do it too. The worst thing in the world is to get with some people to do something and nobody knows who's supposed to do what and who's going to get what. That's going to break up your life. It's going to break up your friendship. There's ministries in this sanctuary that need to be birthed. Where the men, I don't know how we, if we're going to do this, what we're going to do. I don't want to talk about it because I don't want to sound like it's talking about me. I'm pumping gas yesterday, an older lady in the car, in the next lane behind the car who's getting ready to pump. I'm finishing up. She said, excuse me, excuse me, could you help me? I said, yeah. I said, I can help. You want me to pump your gas? She said, yes. I said, well, I'm going to pull up, get out of the way of the car behind me, and I'm going to go and pull up over here. And when you pull up, I'm going to come walk back over here, okay? She said, okay. That happened a couple of minutes. And what, when I was talking to her, after I talked, the lady on the other side of the pump, she might even be in here. I told her to come to church. She said, God bless you. I said, for what? She said, God bless you for looking out for that. I said, that's what we're here for. That's what the church is supposed to do. I said, as a matter of fact, listen to this. And it may not happen. I don't know if somebody will let us do this. I said, I'm going to go back and tell the men and women at our church that we need to go to, I was at BJ's, maybe talk to the management and say, look, in the wintertime or whenever, can we have ministry out here where we can be on a pump and it can be designated that if you need your gas pump on pump six, seven, and eight, there's people that will pump your gas for you. And, and I told her that yesterday. When I got home, the Lord said, check it out. Let's go see if maybe a day, day like today when it's cold outside and women don't want to get out of the, don't need to get out of the car. Shouldn't have to. You got the kids in the car, whatever. And the older and senior people don't need or people who are sick or get hurt, can't get out. Maybe we should just be at the pump. I don't know. They used to have uh, gas attendants back in the day when service was real. Come on, somebody. When they used to have real service, they come out and pump your gas and check under your hood and, and put a windshield wiper fluid in your car and check your oil and air pressure in your tires and give you $3 on, you know. But they don't do that anymore. But maybe the church is supposed to fill in the gaps where the world is no longer serving like they should. Maybe that's it. So I'm going to find out. We're going to go and ask. I'm going to ask. We'll say, hey, can we do that? Can we do that? Can we do that? It's not Christmas time yet. It just left. I'm going to put this out there now for our men and our women. Here's an idea I've been carrying for a long time. Holiday season in our mall. We have several different places, but the primary one, Peninsula Town Center. People that are coordinated, that go through uh, with the police department helping us. I've been through several uh, community uh, police programs, myself, um, neighborhood programs, things that the city offers. So you can be aware of what goes on in your city. And, and I'll get Corporal uh, uh, Williams to come if it's possible help us to, cre to create a, a patrol that just has on, you know, the right colors, all unified, everybody certified, covered, we know who everybody is, and we just walk through the mall in the holidays to make sure that everything stays copacetic. Just the presence of people could help change things. We got all the way until December, so, gentlemen, let's figure it out. See why I'm talking like this? See, because whenever we do what we just did and you begin to fast and pray, God begins you, gives you ideas that are out of the ordinary. These are simple things, however. But there's some of you all that God's going to give ideas that transcend what you've ever done. That's what you need to understand. You need to understand that God's just not trying to do normal and regular stuff for you. He's trying to do it exceedingly. And I've been looking that word up and studying it, but I'm not going to get into that right now fully exceedingly abundantly above all you could dare ask or imagine do you know what imagination is has anybody ever imagined anything do you know that God can do more than your imagination I was messing with my wife yesterday I said honey we're gonna go to a few places and some of them are places in the desert I said there's everything in Vegas ain't bad they say they call it sin city but they got my friends say they got good food and some good shows so I might go to Vegas I've never been there I said, we're going to go to Dubai. We've been to a lot of places. I said, two places that were built in deserts. Two places that were built in deserts. Do you know in Dubai, they have indoor skiing? Some of y'all, who've been to Dubai? Anybody? None of y'all. We all going then. None of y'all been. We all going to get on a plane. We all going to fly over there. We just going to fly to Dubai. Get your passports. We just going to fly to Dubai. We're going to Dubai. Angelina. We're going to Dubai. <laughs> 
not the church. <laughs> not in front of all the people. So that's my cousin. We, we're going to Dubai. But even if we don't go to Dubai, you know somebody imagine a city in the desert? Has anyone ever decorated anything in your house where the room was empty and then you just went and figured it out? Isn't it fun? Painting and putting up window treatments and getting all sorts of fixtures and furniture. Isn't it fun? That's the God we serve takes blank lives and fills them up with beautiful things. Yeah. Let me stop. I got to stop now anyways because we got to make some transitions. Thanks for being with us today, Marquise Pastor. I mean, Keith couldn't be here today. Marquise came over. It's good to see you. God bless. But I know he has to, he has to depart in a minute. Amen. Amen. He, he came over to, to fill in for Keith who couldn't be here. He had to, uh, another assignment this morning. And so Marquise came in and filled in, but got to release him so he can go to his other assignment. And that's okay. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, what y'all sit down for? No, I'm just kidding. Y'all can stay. This is that stand up and run around the church type of thinking right here. This is that I ain't sitting down. It's time for me to go get at it, get to it, get with it. You should be like, let me out of here, Pastor. I don't need to sit here and listen to you another second. I got something to do. I got to go. There's a world out there waiting for my ideas to hit them. I love what one of my, my bishops, one of the mentors that I su submit to and listen to and learn from, Bishop McLaughlin, how he says that Sunday is the most anticlimactic day of the week for the church. And it should be. It should be the least of all the days that we, in a sense, not look forward to, but expect the greatest things out of. God does great things when we gather. Yes, he does. But you should be expecting miracles Monday through Saturday. And we should be functioning Monday through Saturday and come together on Sunday to testify about it, to get refilled, to get encouraged, to get direction. But the, the reverse is in, in motion in most people's lives where, and most ministries where the most important day is Sunday and then the rest of the week, nothing happens. People just sit and wait and then we sit back and we get critical of the church and church don't have the right color carpet and the air conditioner was too high, the heat is too low and sister so-and-so had on too much makeup and so-and-so's dress was too long. And that's the kind of stuff, you know, ridiculous church people do. I said Ridiculous. Some of my leaves over there are taking it to, <laughs> take it to another level. But that's what we do. We, and, and church is not about that. Being a part of the kingdom of God is not about those things that are, that are insignificant like that. But how many times have churches had fights and splits and so many things because the people weren't being who God called them to be? Let me tell you what you don't have time for when you're being what you're being supposed to be. Everyone in here has lifted some weights. Everyone has been under, you know, some, a squat bar or you've been under the bench press. These are things that can hurt you. I remember, you know, lifting an, a, an extreme amount of weight from my size when I was in college playing football. It was a lot. I was up under there, a little eight, 18, 19 year old with 463 pounds on my back. I think that's when my knee went out. It didn't go out then. I lifted it, but I heard something like that. I didn't have my knees wrapped up. Yeah, it's part of the process. But that's the most weights I ever lifted on my back. I was a football player, and I was under that weight, and just like all the other guys. It was my last rep, and that's when the big linemen and other people stronger than me, that was their first rep. So when I was getting out, they was getting in. They was coming in to lift that. To start, I was finished and probably got injured as a result of it, come to think of it. But my point is that when you're under great weight, you don't have time to be looking over there at somebody else. In other words, when you're up under the bench press, you got no time to be concerned about the man or woman next to you on the other bench press. You better lift yours. I've seen, I've seen it in person, and I've seen it on, on videos and on social media where people have been lifting weights by themselves, and what happened? It comes down on them. One man almost died. If it wasn't for, I don't know, he was, the weight was barely across his throat. I mean, it was across his throat, but he, he just kept turning and pushing and under, out of desperation, and he got out. But he was this close to dying. Because how many of you know that 300 pounds on your throat will kill you? It will kill you. So what am I saying? In this life, when you're doing the things that you're supposed to do, you have enough need to focus on what you're focusing on, not to be worried about what I'm doing, because what you're doing could kill you if it falls on you the wrong way. Great success can kill you if you let it fall. If you don't get your, your, your structure in place, your infrastructure, 
and you start doing great things, your infrastructure can collapse on you. Your tax system, you know, your, 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 your payroll system, your, your insurance system. If you don't have all those things, if you don't have all of your, your documents updated around, around your building about employee, workers' compensation, and all the things that we have to have in order to run a business successfully in church, ministry, for those who didn't know, it has the same components as any business that you'll ever operate, pretty much, infrastructure-wise. Legal, accounting, governmental, staffing, facilities, and all of the things that go along with operating uh, a business, bank relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And you, if, you don't have your, if you don't have your life in order in your home, if you don't have a budget or at least an understanding of where your money's going, it will crush you. It'll catch up with you. You'll look in your bank account and then things will be overdrafted. And has anyone ever over, overdrawn your account? Embarrassed. Hand up, though. <laughs> a little embarrassed. <laughs> Why did that happen? Because we didn't have a system at the time. Or we ignored the system. It wasn't because you didn't have a system, but sometimes you can ignore the system. But ignoring the system will still get you in trouble. You can't close your eyes, you know. It's like when you're a kid and they teach you crazy stuff like there's a boogeyman or whatever, and you close your eyes, and the boogeyman goes away. Okay. But let me tell you what doesn't go away. Taxes don't go away when you close your eyes. As a matter of fact, let me close them real hard. <laughs> Nope, they're still there. <laughs> Elder, they're still right there. Don't you wish they would go with it? Property taxes getting on my nerves. And taxes, are you, all sorts of taxes. You can close your eyes as tight as you can. And when we open them, guess what? Ta-da! They're still right there, waiting for your payment. Your job is not going to go anywhere. If you're going to get paid, you got to go. How many wish you could just close your eyes real tight and still get the pay and not have to go? <laughs> Some days. But it doesn't work that way. You still got to go in and do the time, do the hours, do, do the, the work that's necessary for the salary to be justified that you have you know, earned and that you receive. So every one of us in this sanctuary have an opportunity to see greater things from God, but we have to think in a greater way. We have to allow God to give us a new system, a new infrastructure, a new way of thinking. A bold new world is before us, you know, a bold new, a wonderful experience is waiting on you. It's different for everyone in the sanctuary. It's different for you because God has a unique plan for you. It may be similar to mine. Again, I said lifting weights. You, you can own a, we have a good, a good friend, uh, Larry and his wife, George, are good friends, and they have a daughter named Winter, and she is one of the best pastry makers on the planet. Cupcake Wars, she's been on that, and won, I think she win, and she won that. And she makes cakes look, look like shoes, and you think it's really a Louboutin. You're like, is that really a shoe? No, it's a cake. She's that good. Her bakery could be right next door to yours. Doesn't mean because she's got all those accolades that you can't be successful. But if you keep looking out the window at her, watching her, and don't do nothing, you know, anything, guess what you're not going to do? You're not going to have anything on your shelf to sell to anyone, you know? People might even know she's the best in the world, but still see you and go, hmm, I've never heard of this place. Let me try them. Or her line might be too long and somebody's in a rush and they say, I don't have time to wait in that line. Run. Oh, there's another baker. Let me run in here and grab a donut or whatever. My point is, is that if you keep your eyes on everybody else's business, you'll never take care of yours. Somebody ought to get that. Somebody ought to get that. Mind your business. Look at somebody and say, mind your business. That's what I, I said that in a nice way. I'm going to go ahead and say it just right in your face. Mind your business. Look at your name and say, mind your business. Mind your business. Mind your business. Sick and tired of you being in my business. I'm sorry. Mind, mind your business. Mind your business. All in my business. And you in my business can't take care of your business. Mind your business. You need to tell two more people that because the church, we, we need to hear that. Mind your business. Mind your business. Just mind your business. All in my business. My business ain't none of your business, especially if you ain't going to help me with it. You know they broke. Well, give me some money. You worry about me being so broke? Hook me up. Invest in my life. Give me a little help. <laughs> Look how broke they are. They struggling. <laughs> well, then come, come alongside me. Don't talk about me. Walk with me. I want to tell us one more person, mind their business. Come on, one more time. Mind your business. Tell somebody. Mind your business. 
I feel good, Joe, that all our life we've been in church. We haven't been able to tell people, mind their business. People get on your nerves, all in your business. <laughs> the Bible calls it busybodies, and it particularly talks about women who are busybodies, but men are busybodies too. Maybe not in the same way, you know, all the time, but you could be on some jobs. You got some guys, hey, man, did you hear? Hey, man, do you know? Yo, bro, I got to tell you something. Man, shut up. Mind your business. I ain't got time for that. I'm over here under 300 pounds trying to lift it. You over here talking about something. Did I see something? I'm, I'm focused on this weight right here. You're trying to get me killed. How many, of you, how many of you know that God wants you to bear your cross daily? You don't have time to be, again, in my business, if you got to bear your own cross, if you got to lift your own life up. I'm already into the message. I don't, it, I, yeah, it changed. It changed. It has changed directions. So God, God is saying to us this morning, now that we fasted and prayed and studied together, we read 21 days of scripture together. Wasn't that amazing? 21 days, the book of John. And if you didn't get to read all 21 days and you just read some of it or you didn't know about it and you didn't get, get to read any, you can still read the book of John. 21 days. Man, the miracles or the signs and the glory of God and the relationship that we experience reading the book of John. Written by, uh, there's, it's almost anonymous. They say John, but then again, there's some, you know, ideas out there that wasn't John because it says the disciple that he loved, but they named it the book of John. So we'll take that. We're going to go with what we got. But the idea would be is that the signs that God wrought, you understand the miracles Jesus bestowed upon the, the people, the blessings, the things he brought them into, seeing Lazarus get healed. How many of you know that God is a healing God? He's a healing God. And that he's going to heal. He's going to heal your life in every way. That's why we were praying for mental health. We pray for our children's minds and lives. And, and he is a healing God. And, you know, I was, what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm already in it. I was going to resume the teaching that we started and we didn't go back into last week because the spirit moved. And that is the teacher is here. And the teacher started working already. Because all of us have begun to experience in our minds thoughts that make us feel like we've got to do something greater and better. I threw a couple of ideas out just to serve people, pumping gas and patrolling a, a community facility if we get permission to. Just to be out there and have a presence. Just, just, just to let your neighbor know when you go out of town, I'll watch your house. When you go out of town, build a good enough relationship. Our relationships with our neighbors are pretty good. And, They'll call us and say, we're out of town. Could you get that package off my, da off my porch for me? Could you get my mail for me? Could you keep an eye on the house for me? I mean, you can have that kind of relationship with your neighbors because you can serve them in that way. Back to the old cup of sugar days. Go next door, go next door and ask Ms. Rose, can you get a cup of sugar? We can tell you grandma need a cup of sugar. Run next door. Run over there, Miss Powell's house. Miss Powell, my grandma says she need a cup of sugar. Tell your grandma no worries. I'm gonna give her two cups of sugar. He's got two cups of sugar. You run back over there with two cups of sugar. <laughs> Why? Because you have a relationship. God wants us to have that. And and if we're going to be in each other's business, be in my business with prayer. Pray always. Be in my business with your prayer. Be in my business with your prayer. Pray for me. Men ought to always pray and not faint. As a matter of fact, on tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., if you've never been on, you can join us. Every six, every Monday at 6 a.m., we've been on a conference call for I don't know how many years now, and we just are praying and encouraging and instructing, and God gives revelation in that hour that sometimes is so unique because of the diligence that we are exhibiting to find him. Seek him while he yet may be found. So when you get up in the morning, if you're getting ready for work, just put it on, sit it beside you. Put, put your headphones on. Everybody got a pair of headphones, or most of us do. Got something you stick in your ear. Put it on and just walk around the house getting ready and listen. Why? Because when we pray for one another, powerful things will happen. Let, don't raise your hand. When was the last time you deliberately prayed for someone that you had a relationship with in the church that you really didn't know? You just knew you saw them. You, you saw them. And instead of talking about them, the gossip, the not minding your business piece, you say, you know what? I don't know them, but I'm going to pray. God bless them. That's the attitude we need to have, church. Pray one for the other. You, again, don't have to know me. You don't even have to like me to pray for me. 
If you don't like me, it's not up for you to, to, to determine my future because of your dislike. You understand? That's the problem with the world. I was watching Jane Elliott last night. She's a woman with the blue eye, brown eye um, test. She's a white woman who tells people all over the world that she said there's one race, the human race. And since it's Black History Month, I was looking at some things, and I'll probably share one thought before we leave today. But she said there's only one race. It's the human race. In sub-Saharan Africa is where it started. She said, so everybody in here, and she's a white lady, a little gray hair now. She's 80-something years old, but she's been doing this for years. She said, so everybody in here is black. That's what she says to everybody in the room. She don't care who's in the room. She said, everybody in here came from a black woman. Just like that. Some of y'all don't, don't believe that. It's true. Read. Look at where God created Look who he created. And then look at genetically and, and scientifically what's capable of happening and what's not capable of happening. Look what can create anything out of it and what can't create everything out of it. There's some science behind it. Period. Period. There's some of you all with three or four different brothers and sisters from the same parents that all look quite a bit different. Because even though your mom and daddy dark skinned, but your great, your great great grandma was light skinned, this sister looked like her. Because the genes couldn't came all the way down and skipped over your mom and daddy and threw them, and now your sister light skinned. And the rest of y'all dark. You like, she our sister? Yes, she your sister. She just looked like your grandma. Say amen. The darkest people on the planet can produce some of the lightest people and some of the all different color eyes. And so it's not in it, the society has created all this stuff, the white, the black to create separation. But it's not about that. It's about who God is and what he says we are. That's most important because nobody cares really what color you are. If you're an evil person, I don't care what color you are. Evil come in all colors. I don't like evil dark-skinned people, evil light-skinned people. I don't like evil curly-haired people or evil, evil straight-haired people. Evil people are evil people. I'm looking for the good people on the earth, amen, so that we can help the evil people not be evil, you know? Don't, don't, don't find a whole lot of, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, pride in your, in your color. It means nothing. Now, how many of you know it's going to get old and wrinkle up anyway? Yeah. Yeah. And nothing wrong with wrinkles. You earn those wrinkles. We all earning them. All the little crows feeding all that. Don't worry about it. It's all good. I got something for everybody today. The young and the old. Got some, something for everybody. But the main thing is, ultimately, you understanding that the teacher is here and that he wants you to be who he called you to be. And I'm going to emphasize again, it starts with you making sure that you realize that you are under the weight of the responsibility to be what he called you to be. In other words, you're on the bench press. You're on the leg press. And you don't have time to look at me right now. To take your eye off what you're doing could kill you. To take your eye off the road could kill you. I've, I've had my wife and one of my daughters in the car and a dog, one of our dogs at the time, and drove off the road, not because I wanted to, but we hit ice. I didn't take my eye off the road and I was actually driving slower than I normally would drive, wasn't I? And just made one sudden move and ended up down in a ravine or well, in, the, in the median. Thank God this side we went off of and not the other side. State trooper came, and he said, y'all are lucky. And I was like, we're blessed. Praise God. I wasn't trying to be super-duper spiritual. I was still nervous. You know, your heart be beating because you just had an accident. And I was like, didn't want to try to be contentious with the man. But he said, you guys are lucky. I said, well, well thank you. But I thank God we're blessed like that. But he said, because on the other side, this wouldn't have ended up like this. So I guess on the other side of the road, it was a long drop-off. We were coming back from Radford by through um, Lynchburg, picking up Shay and stopped by to see Bree. So when Shay was at Radford and Bree was at Liberty. And we were driving back with Shay to take her to a doctor's appointment. And man, that happened. So me standing here with the microphone and my wife sitting over there and Shay being here and the dog. Dog's still alive too. She was in the car. And we're still here because of the grace of God. Now, I don't know that we would have died going off the other side, but it may not. Have, as the man said, wouldn't have been this easy to get to you. You know? And so you got to keep your eye on the road. Even when you're being careful, there's going to be problems is what I'm saying. 
I was being careful. I just said it. My wife confirmed, and she knows how I drive. I drive good. I drive seriously. I drive under control. I drive with a purpose. <laughs> she laughed. She's like, I know how you drive. No, no, I'm not a bad driver. I'm a great driver. Thank you, Jesus. But you don't have time taking your eyes off the road. Texting and driving is not smart. Amen. Some of y'all feel convicted now. It's like, all of us have got to be careful with this thing in the car. Every last one. If you know you need to be careful with this thing in the car, raise your hand. Come on. As a matter of fact, get it in your hand. Come on, I'm serious. Get your phone in your hand. You got it. Don't play with me. I ain't in the playing mood today. I don't feel like playing. I don't feel like playing with nobody. No, I feel like playing with nobody. Anybody ever not been in the playing mood? I'm laughing, but I really, you never see your mother smile, your father smile, but they really don't be playing. <laughs> They got that laugh, and <laughs> that means something about to happen. That's how I feel. I'm, I'm talking about the devil, though. I don't feel like playing with him. Tell yourself, I will not let technology destroy my life by what I watch on it, by who I talk to on it, by when I use it. In Jesus' name, amen. What you watch on it, everybody knows what you watch on it. All of us got to be more concise and more specific and more particular about what we allow into our eye gates and ear gates through these things. Because you can get to anything on these. You can get to anything on these. And, and everything that we can get to on these things, it's not for our consumption. We shouldn't be consumed. You're grown enough, you can consume whatever you want to, but it's not really good for your spiritual growth. And it's not really good for your family. It's not really good for your relationships. So we're going to be careful from henceforth on what we watch on these things listen to on these things because it takes you to any place in the world. I mentioned Dubai earlier. If you want to go on a tour of Dubai, open up your phone right now and you can find somebody who will take you on a virtual tour of Dubai into some places that they've traveled. Amen. Also, who you talk to on this phone. How many of you know that there's some people you should talk to and some people you shouldn't talk to on these? Say amen. amen. And so there's some people that you need to tell. You can't talk to them no more. You need to take their number out of your phone and stop talking to them because they're not healthy. They're not useful. They're not beneficial to you. So take them out your phone because they don't need to be talking to you anyway. I can't get a lot of amens from some. I know. I know. Now you want to tell me my, my business. <laughs> this is my business. <laughs> this is my business. <laughs> the Bible says I'm supposed to equip people in the church for the work of ministry. This is how I do it. And I'm doing it based on what I understand the war to be. I'm in the same war you're in, what to watch, what not to watch, who to talk to, what, who not to talk to. Here, thirdly, when to use this thing. Stop taking chances. Stop thinking you can put the steering wheel between your knees and hold this up high, and even though you got it right across the steering wheel, you can see all the traffic, and you're going to see everything. You're going to miss something and end up dead or kill somebody. Please stop playing with yourself. Please stop playing with your life and other people's lives. You know the phone was that heavy, did you? You thought it just because it cost a lot and you had a certain brand name that it was important. No, it's important for you to know how to use this thing. This thing is deadly. This thing is, I'm going to say it again, it's deadly. It is deadly. With much knowledge comes much grief. The Bible says that. It's a scripture. With, with much knowledge, knowing a lot of stuff can grieve you. To know too much can grieve you. So be careful what rabbit trails you end up on that your soul is not ready to contend with. Be careful what you search out on this thing because it will end you up in a place where you might actually start living in a way that God doesn't want you to live. Say amen. If you got your Bible app on here, the only thing you should, the thing, the thing that you should do on the phone is to study your word if you can. But that's not the only thing you can do. Have fun with your phone. Enjoy the things that technology affords us to have. But just be careful. Somebody say be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Some of y'all need to be deleting some stuff right now, though. Go ahead and delete that app. You know how easy it is. Click on it. It starts blinking. Hit the little minus sign. And then, then y'all don't. <laughs> Somebody's like, I got to pray about deleting that one first. It's out there now. It's in the atmosphere. You know what you're responsible for, the Bible says? What you know. You know, the Bible is really good at covering all the bases. He, God doesn't even hold you responsible for what you don't know. It only says that you're responsible for what you, what you do know. And guess what you know now? What I just told you. I don't like him. 
He getting on my nerves. Can we just ease out right now? <laughs> I'm talking like I used to talk. <laughs> this is really touching home right here. I wonder if somebody told him about me. He's like, man, all in my business. We should have never came to this conference. We should have stayed home. People in here prophesying to us and stuff, stuff that they shouldn't know. I don't even know if I should say thank you, Jesus, or help me, Jesus. Ever been there? We don't know what to say, help me, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. The teacher is here. We, we, we talked about that because Mary ran back to the house and got Martha because Jesus showed up to bring Lazarus out of the grave. This is two weeks ago now. So we're reading the scripture. We saw that that happened and it transpired in, in John. And when Mary encountered Jesus, she ran back to go and get Martha because Jesus said, go get her. So she went quickly and told her to come quickly because Jesus had, had um, you know, deliberately come at the time that he had come to do the things that he was doing in front of everybody. And that, that, that was to stand and believe God and to call Lazarus forth after four days of him being dead. So again, that's the basic recap. So the teacher, Jesus, rabbi, which means teacher, rabbi, he, he was there to instruct the people and he was instructing them by example. He said, I'm about to do something that is going to happen in front of you for your benefit, not mine. In other words, what he was about to do in raising Lazarus up was not something that he was unfamiliar with. They never had to raise up anybody from the dead in heaven, of course. That's not what they ever had to do. There's no scripture that says that dead people are in heaven. That's not it. But Jesus, knowing who God is, being God himself, a part of the triune Godhead, understood the power of who they are. And he knew that when he spoke whatever word he was going to speak, whenever he spoke it, that it would transpire simply because he is the word. And in John chapter 1, where we read in the beginning was what? The word. And the word was God and the word was with God. And then the word became incarnate, verse 14, and the word became flesh, chapter 1, and dwelt among men. And so we now understand that Jesus is God. He's been with God, and he's been there from the beginning. So he put into motion the idea of time. He put into the motion the idea of, of presence. He put into motion the idea of, of, of gravity and weight in the earth. In other words, we're here to do things. We're God. I am. Jesus said, I am. And he was connecting himself to what he is, God. When Moses asked at the burning bush who this was in this bush, God said, I am that I am. Jesus also said in the New Testament, well, I am. Why? Because they both are the same, one and the same. And so when we look at this and we think about the teacher teaching us, the teacher is here. Somebody say the teacher is here. The teacher is here to teach you in these moments at your burning bush. What is your burning bush? It is that situation that seems, as Moses saw, unusual. A bush on fire in the desert that's not getting smaller, but yet on fire. In other words, fire consumes most plants. Well, every plant. This particular plant was not getting consumed. And so therefore, when Moses saw it, he turned aside, the Bible said, and he was curious. God wants you to be curious about your next position. He wants you to be curious about what he's saying. He wants you to inquire from within. He wants you to ask so that you can receive, seek so that you can find, knock so that the door can be open unto you. So the teacher, we went over these first three things and we looked at the, the things that he said when he said, I am. And when he said that he was, I am, he said, I am the bread of life. We covered that. He said, I am the light of the world. We covered that. And we made it to the third one. I am the door of the sheepfold. And we talked about that and how good shepherds bring their sheep inside their home for safety. Now we're going to talk about the good shepherd. Jesus fourthly said, I am the good shepherd. The teacher is teaching now. And what did he mean by that? The Israelites recognize historically the importance of shepherds based on their culture. Their culture of herding and shepherding, agriculture, living off the land. These are still important things now. 
but most of us don't have to engage in them because we have grocery stores. Amen. But in those days, in order for people to be sustained, they worked on farms or they related to people who worked on farms and did herding and provided meat and veg vegetation or vegetables, etc. So they were familiar with this, this particular um, method and modality of living. Shepherds were commonplace. They were common in such a way that people saw them operating and they saw what they did and the importance of them. They protected the animals from the, the beast of the field. They protected the animals from sickness and disease and from the weather. They would make sure that the animals, the livestock, the cattle that produced the milk, the, the, uh, the sheep that produced the, uh, the wool and, and uh, all the other animals that they might have, the goats and whatever they herded that produced a level of sustenance for their lives. In other words, the shepherds were marketplace overseers. They were supply and demand process. They were a part of the supply chain. They were helping the community to have wherewithal and again, uh, commodity. And so when we look at this, we understand that they understand the importance of it from a natural perspective. But the Israelites also understood as they were, the shepherds were an integral part of their origin and their nation as a people. And God used this scripture in Psalm 23. He's what? Shepherd. He's our shepherd and we shall not want. Jesus or God, God used this, this analogy, this this way of us helping us to think about him to make us understand shepherds. But it was more applicable in their day. We understand it simply because we just have logic. We have reason. We see what a shepherd does. And so he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want in Psalm 23. But when we look at this, as the Israelites understood this, shepherds became synonymous with leadership, both political and spiritual. A reference to a good shepherd would serve as a deliberate, uh, a deliberate action or deliberate uh, scathing criticism to those who were in leadership who were failing to serve properly. So when someone says good shepherd versus bad shepherd, it will be a scathing criticism to those who were bad leaders. If someone says he's a bad shepherd, it would say that he's not tending the flock properly. They're losing sheep every day. Lions and leopards are coming in. Hyenas, whatever would have existed in that particular terrain, are coming in and stealing the sheep, taking cattle. And we're losing cattle every day because he's afraid to look out. She's afraid to help. They're not, they're not mindful of the weather. They don't feed their, their flock properly. They don't allow them to drink when they need to drink. They don't feed them the proper sustenance so that they can grow strong and fat and healthy. And so a good shepherd in the scripture, according to those in, uh, of Israel, a good shepherd was one that was a good leader, one that would take care of the needs of the flock. And when we're learning as, as, as God is teaching us right now, this is just not about people like myself who stand in front of a congregation, who've been given titles as God has allowed elevation. It's not just about us. It's about each one of us individually understanding the need for us to be good leaders in our own right in every space that we operate in. People that function properly from a kingdom perspective that know how to go out and how to come in. That's important. How you go out and how you come in is important. How you go out is speaking of your preparation. How you come in is speaking of your accomplishment. You go out prepared. When you leave your home in the morning, you go to work prepared. You go to school prepared. And when you come home, you give a report. Good things happen on the, on the job. I made three sales. We accomplished the task. We finished the project. We're on our way to finishing the project. You go to school, you come back. I got good grades today. I was able to accomplish this. So you go out prepared and you come back with report. So if you're going to go out and come in as a good leader, you have to be prepared when you go out and you have to know that your assignment must be accomplished when you come back. 
I don't want to go out and shepherd the flock and go out unprepared without my staff, without my mind clear, without my eyes sharp, without my ears open, to go out and take care of any business in my life and go out and have a less than standard or less than par outing. So every one of us need to understand this. The teacher is speaking or teaching, and he wants us to know that in moments like this, we're getting ready to be prepared to go out. That's what the church is about. This is what it's all about. It's not about you coming in and being satisfied with this experience. This experience is just uh, uh, sequential. It is a part of the process. It is a part of the process. You're here today to get prepared to go out so that when you come back next week, you come back rejoicing, saying, Pastor, this was a good week. Apostle, man, we blessed, we blessed so many families this week. So many people got prayed for. My business is successful. We were able to, to bless some folks. And here, here we're giving to the ministry and we're building this, we're doing that. Church is for the, the preparation of the believer so that you are prepared to go out and do the work of ministry. That's what the Bible says. That we are the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, are here for the equipping of the saints, for the work of going out. So that when you come back, you come back empty and you get refilled, replenished. Or you come back not empty, you come back strong and ready to go for more. Telling others about how good God is in the process. And so therefore you have to ask yourself henceforth, when I go to ministry, to come to Cornerstone, to go to the ministry, am I being equipped? Yes, you are. But what am I doing with what I've been equipped with when I go out? You come here with, to get resources to go back out into the world to accomplish what God has called you to accomplish. And then we together glorify the Lord for the accomplishments that we all celebrate. All right. In Ezekiel chapter 34, God reminds or reprimands the people he had appointed to be the spiritual protectors and guides for his people, exclaiming that they had only sought to care for themselves and had left the people of God vulnerable and unprotected. This statement resonates again as a beggar was healed, as a beggar who was rather healed was thrown out by his protectors and guides. You know, when, 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 when you see things like the Good Samaritan in the scripture, who walked past the man that was hurting? A priest? A Sadducee and a Pharisee? Other religious leaders? Walked past the person who was hurting. Again, they were too busy trying to fulfill their own lives to do what God sent them out to do. As I talked about the little lady yesterday, asking, beckoning, could, could she get help? Not about me. I'm saying it so maybe we can do something bigger. And I brought it as an example. But what if I was just too busy? No, ma'am, I can't help you. Too busy. Eh, too busy for you right now. I think somebody else still probably would have helped her. But what are we going to do when it's supposed to be us that's helping? And, and there's nobody else behind us to help. What if the next person doesn't show up? In other words, the teacher is teaching today, and he's teaching us to be in position to serve. That's what we are. We are in position to serve. We're going to be like the good shepherd. Look out for the needs of others. Then Jesus goes on to say, I'm the resurrection, and I am the life. I am the resurrection and the life. So when we think about this saying, this statement occurs in close proximity uh, to a miracle performed by Jesus. The resurrection, of course, of Lazarus is the only one of its kind. And it's recorded within the book of John, as we stated, as with the other physical miracles and I am sayings, this spectacular uh, moment points beyond the event itself. Jesus didn't do that simply because he wanted them to see his power. He wanted them to know that there was a God who had that kind of power. Let me say that again. If the only thing that was important in that moment to Jesus was raising up Lazarus, then the story would be over. But Jesus didn't do it like that for that reason. 
He said, Father, I'm doing this so that they might hear and they might see, so that they might believe. Lazarus getting up was a good thing. But what God wants us to understand is that he can make your dry bones come alive. What he wants you to understand is that there's nothing dead in your life that he can't resurrect. There's nothing about you that he can't heal. There's nothing about you that he can't fix. There's nothing about your future that he hadn't already made provision for you to walk in a way of health into these, into these things. So therefore today, when I think about Lazarus, I'm saying thank you Jesus for doing that so I can see that you are God with that kind of power. He said, I am. Same thing God was telling Moses. He said, what do I tell the people if they refute what I'm telling? He says, tell them I am that I am sent you. In other words, he said, everything that I, they need is in me. You tell them that I'm okay with what I got. You tell them to believe what I said. And so he, Moses left and, and told the people. And they still pushed back. Then he told Pharaoh, who, again, the Bible says his heart, heart was hardened so that God could show his power. Do you know the scripture says that? Poor Pharaoh. God made an example out of him. But he should have had the right attitude. God already knew his attitude was going to be bad. And so God said, since he's going to have a bad attitude, let's make an example out of him. That's terrible. What am I telling you? Let your ways be pleasing to God. The meditation of your heart and the words of your mouth. Let them be pleasing to God. Because God will let you have what you act like. He will let you have what you act like. If you want to act mean, he'll let you have mean life. If you want to act evil, he'll let you have evil, evil circumstances. If you want to act selfish, he'll let you have a selfish lifestyle. So Pharaoh hardened his heart against God. God said, I'm going to use his hard heart against him. And I'm going to show my power. So Moses walked in there and said, okay, Pharaoh, God said, let, let his people go. Pharaoh said, you know, and I know it ain't just like Cecil B. DeMille, but that's the only reference I got. I will not do it. You know, he was real, you know, theatrical in, the, in Moses, the Ten Commandments. I will not. <laughs> so let it be written, so let it be done. All that kind of stuff, all this, you know, old English and all that. That's the only one I got. I haven't seen any other movies that were as good as that one. So that I go way back into the 70s and draw from that movie. And Moses said, okay, with his gray hair. And, you know, remember Moses and he's standing by, you know, uh, what was his name, Charleston Heston standing by the Red Sea. And they had them old graphics back then. And, uh, the wind was blowing and the border was parting. The people were about to flee from, from uh, Egypt's uh, bondage. And, and there, was, there was Moses. Well, we serve that same God. He's better than the one from the movie, though. <laughs> Amen. And so we, we have to understand that God is teaching us. He's teaching us to trust him for miracles. That's why he let the people see that. He said, now I'm going to leave. Jesus was doing it. He said, because I'm going to leave, but I want y'all to know that you can trust my God for these same kind of miracles. Do you hear what I just said? You can trust God. When I'm gone, you can trust the same God I'm showing you this in front of, you this, him, me, and I in front of you, this thing, you can trust him for miracles. And he'll raise you up, and he'll raise up your family. All right? So our idea of resurrection is, is somewhat different than the, the Greek and the Jewish ideas. Uh, the two primary cultural in, uh, influences uh, in Jesus' time were, of course, the, the Greek and the Jews. And the Greeks thought of the body as a hindrance to true life. And they looked forward to uh, a time when the soul would be free from its shackles. And that's kind of true. The body is somewhat of a hindrance, but you can't live this life without it. But the, they thought it was a total hindrance. And so they weren't wrong totally because the, the flesh is contradictory to the will of God. But you can't live this life on this earth and, and, be, and be doing that without a body. Say amen. All right. So they firmly rejected the idea of resurrection, the bodily resurrection. They didn't think that that was possible because they didn't think that the body could be resurrected. They didn't think that it could be healed. That's the way they felt about it. The Jewish people believed in resurrection that the body would be raised from the dead and it would happen at the end of time according to what they believe scripturally, all right? But without transformation. So they didn't believe in the transformative power of God. And so therefore, they didn't believe that God could heal and restore and the dead in Christ be raised and all that remain would be caught up to be with him. They didn't believe it to that degree. 
And so therefore, the word that Jesus was teaching about a full resurrection, and when he even talked about himself, if you, if you tear down the temple in three days, it will rise again. They didn't realize what he was saying. He was saying in the same way, I'm about to die, be buried in this tomb. I'm going to be raised from the dead. It's going to happen to everyone that believes. You're going to die, you're going to be buried, and you're going to be raised back to life according to God's will. And so when that happens, we'll all see it and experience it. And I know that's one of the mysteries of the church and one of the things that we marvel at. But in the meantime, what you do in your body is the most important. <clears throat> Believe for miracles. Believe the power of God for your life. One of my biggest challenges as a pastor is to speak to a multitude of people at any time of any magnitude of size and know that in the room is always people that can do better than they're doing spiritually. I always know that. I'm never under any delusion that that's not really true. I don't care how long people have been going to church, how many Bibles you've, how many times you've read the Bible, how many translations of the Bible that you've read. Everyone in the room can do better, better spiritually. Say amen. And so I, I, I'm challenged with that. I'm always wanting people to do better spiritually, but also not just spiritually, but also practically. How many of you know that all of us can do better practically? Amen. I don't care how organized your life is. All of us can do better because there's more that we can accomplish if we shift and make certain tweaks to our lives. And God wants that. And some, watch this, more than others. Some of you are doing amazing things practically. You have your life set up. And I talk about these things because if I don't talk about them, people won't, I won't say you won't know them, but you, you won't, some won't understand the importance of them. Sometimes I, I teach like this because when you're thinking about the word of God, if you make it all spiritual and no natural, then you're going to be disconnected. Somebody say all spirit and no word. No, you don't have to say it. Y'all are just engaged today. Someone once said all spirit and no word, you'll blow up and all word and no spirit, you'll dry up. So you need to have the spirit and the word be in balance because if all you do is study the law, study the law and don't realize the life that comes from the word and the spirit, then you're just going to dry up because the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So you just can't know every scripture and then hold your life to a strict regimen. I'm going to do the word. I'm going to do the word. You need to understand the liberty that comes in the spirit where the spirit of the Lord is. There's what? Liberty. Liberty to do what? To live this life. But I'm encouraged every time I think about the body of Christ to remind people to have your house in order. I talked about the phone, what we, what we um, watch and listen and hear, who we talk to and engage with, and when we actually use this thing. But also, when you read the scripture, don't just read what we just read and not think that Jesus is telling people, be ready for the afterlife, but take care of the current life as well. That means what? Get some insurance. I got to go here today. Because the teacher is teaching. He's telling me to tell the body of Christ, be insured. Get your, get your will together. Get your trust together. Get your investments in order. You know? Buy, and, buy some things that, that, will, will be, uh, uh, ab that you'll be able to bequeath or pass on in inheritance to your coming generations. Things that increase in value that are working and increasing in value right now. The way that the world is changing, one shift in the world can change the value of various commodities. So we can't, really, we can't really always depend on certain things because oil, even though there's a power behind the oil system, it is powerful, but the electrical component of the world where they're trying to do away with gas cars and bring oil, at some point something's going to give. And what is now valuable might become invaluable. You understand that? There are things that once were valuable that have no value anymore in the same magnitude or degree. Why? Simply because something shifted in society, something shifted in culture. Everything is one shift away from becoming valuable or not valuable when it comes to the way that men measure and the way that we uh, come up with, a, with an economic plan that says something has value in it so that we can use it in commerce with exchange in mind. And so when, when we think of that, know, know what to <coughs> ask God. Be, be prayerful. God, what should I invest in? Any, any stocks that we invest in, they can change overnight. Has anybody ever lost money in the stock market? Yeah. Amen and amen. Look at your portfolio one day and you're smiling. The next day you're like, Lord, who are these people? What do they do with my money? <laughs> Your, 40, your 401, 
Is it K? Yeah, because we in the ministry, we have a 403B. When you're in non-for-profit, it's a 403, not a 401. So, so, but your 401K is attached to things that are doing like this. And if they attach it to the wrong stuff and your 401 comes crashing down, some people call me up, man, I don't even want to look at it. I said, what's wrong? My stuff just dropped. My, 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 my money just went down rough. What you need me to do? Pray for me, man. Okay, Lord, just pray that he don't look in there. <laughs> <laughs> don't look, bro. If it's going if it's going to make you feel that bad, just don't look. <laughs> look the other way. <laughs> Maybe it'll come back. How many of you know they may not come back? Do, do they still have social security? I know they do. But this is a question that people might be asking in a few years. Do they still have social security? You know? Because the way the world's going if if if, if we stop having people working, we, if we automate everything and there's no more people working, less people are working on the planet and less people are rather giving into the system that we once used, then one day, can you imagine Social Security just all those years you gave into it? And then one day you get to it and it ain't there. Those of, all of you all that's already getting it, use it up. Spend it. Don't let it ride around. Don't let it sit in there. Get it. Take it. Use it. Do your best to get it. It has changed, isn't it? Military people have told me that things have changed. The way they used to get benefits and different things has, has changed some. Not as profitable as they once were. Even though they deserve them still, they, the system has changed. And so things are changing. Somebody said things are changing. But one thing that changes not is God. So therefore, we can realize that he is always the resurrection, which brings things up and the life. Let me see what time it is. Okay. All right. Number six, and then number seven, and then we're done. Number six is this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So while Jesus was comforting his, his disciples, Jesus uh, gives us a wonderful summary of who he is and what he came from heaven to do on our behalf. All right. So he's talking to us. And so in this concise way, it's able for us to encapsulate each of the I am statements that have come before it. We can think about all the things that he said prior to it when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when you think about anything that he said prior to that, the I am statements, they're all encompassed in that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I am the way. Walk therein. How do you find the way? By communicating with God. I want to make this as, as real and simple as possible. The only way for any one of us to succeed in this thing called Christianity is for us to communicate with God. You got to talk to God. Someone once put it like this. If ever you buy an appliance or some type of an electronic device or anything that has a mechanism or a functionality, they give what is called a owner's manual. They, they, they have instruction manual to put it together. Right. And so when you look at the instruction manual or the instruction guide, it tells you nowadays they got a number one, two, three. They got the, the screws and the Allen wrench or whatever that's there that you need to assemble this thing. It's all right there. And then the owner's manual, how you operate it, how you take care of it, how you keep it up and what to do in the case of this type of a function, failure, etc. And you go through all that. Well, if, if you want to know the way to use a thing, you have to follow those instructions. What is the way that is the way that the believer should operate? The way is to get in the word every day. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the word. Let's get into the word. When we read the book of John together, all of us were reading that we're reading and we felt good about it. We felt we felt like we were uh, um, in harmony. We felt as if though we were cooperate, cooperating with with something that was significant for all of us together. God spoke something unique to all of us because we are his children. He does that. Every good parent knows how to talk to every one of their individual, individual children if they have more than one. If you have two or three children, you talk to all of them with love, but all of them get a unique conversation because they're unique children. You don't tell the daughter the same things the same way you tell your sons. You don't tell the oldest son the same stuff you tell the youngest son and vice versa and all between oldest daughter, whatever, however the family's made up if you have more than uh, two children or at least two children or more, 
You talk to them the same, but you talk to them specifically and uniquely because of who they are, what they're going through, because their personalities are different. So when you were reading John and I was reading it the same day, maybe the same time God was saying something to you because you're his child. And he was showing you the way. I am the way. Walk therein. And he was showing you how to walk. Somebody ought to want to know how God wants them to walk. Lord, help me to know how to walk. Because I can't walk like bishop so-and-so. I can't walk like a doctor so-and-so, a pastor so-and-so. I want to walk like you want me to walk. I want to live like you want me to live. And that's the beauty of being in relationship. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. He is the truth. The truth that you know will make you free. In other words, what's going to apply to you? I always connect truth to wisdom. The other night I said, knowledge plus experience plus truth is what wisdom is made up of. You have knowledge of God's word. You have experience of using God's word. And you know that it is the truth because it did not fail. Then you turn it over and use it again. And the same God that helped you in that last circumstance will be the same God that will help you next time. And so therefore, God is consistent. He will not fail. He does not change. So therefore, you can build your wisdom up. And what is your wisdom? Your ability to tell anyone at any time that God is good. He never fails. God ain't going to fail me. He never, I mean, let me tell you about my, what I know. Let me tell you about my experiences. And let me tell you why it's true. That's my, that's my wisdom. That's how I can give it to you. And when we are allowing God to operate like that, it doesn't even contradict with other believers. It always coincides. Your wisdom, when you start sharing your wisdom as a believer, and I share my wisdom, it always points to the same God. You understand that? If we're all talking to God, our stories will be similar. You'll hear something go, man, that sounds similar to my story. Because we're still dealing with the same God. How he does it, I don't know. He's God. The other day, I liked to liken God's ability to the greatest air traffic controller ever. Someone put a live air traffic control um, uh, graphic on, on social media the other day. And I looked at it. And they said, these are the planes that are presently in the sky. And they showed all these little white planes. And they were at different levels. And they were all flying and different, or going, you know, in similar patterns and, and on different routes, leaping from one hub to the next, one airport to the next. And I was like, look at that. Thousands of planes in the sky right now as we speak. There's thousands of planes in the sky right now flying. And the air traffic control from around the United States and Canada and Mexico and around the world, they are organizing it to make sure that every plane stays on the proper course and makes the proper adjustments in the event of inclement weather or some problem that might be ahead of it. And this is amazing how God can allow all of us to fly in this ministry and in life together and not crash. How he allows all of us to fly in the same airspace and get there to our next destination safely. How God is concerned about your route as much as he's concerned about my route. That God is not going to make me get there faster than you for my benefit or you to get there faster than me for your benefit. He's going to make both of us get there when we should. Amen. If we just happen to get there at the same time, then that's fine. But if you get there before me, praise God. And then you look back and holler down there, Ralph, it's good down here. And I was like, woo, thanks, look. Thanks, my brother. <laughs> woo, woo, I'll see you in a minute. I often tell people when the children of Israel left from Egypt, it was over a million of them. How many of you know a million people don't walk side by side? They walk in a line. So a few hours before, I don't know how many hours it takes for a million people to move from here to across the street walking. I don't know. If, a million, if I'm the first one of a million, how long does it take for the last person to get across the street? If we started walking, there was a million people behind me, and I just started walking at this pace. And, and across the street, just to the other side, to that sidewalk across the street was the destination. How long will it take the last person to get there? My point would be is that I'm going to see it first. It might even be raining back there and not up here. You understand? The sun might be baking them back there and it could be raining up here. Or in our area, it could be snowing on the front and raining in the back. You understand? But the point being is that we're all going. And just because your experience is a little different doesn't mean you're not going to make it. You just got to go through what you got to go through when you get to it. Yesterday, gas prices were $3.10. Well, today, and I tell you, whoa, I got gas for $3.10 yesterday. And it wasn't $3.10. I just made that up. 
hope I'm, I'm, I'm calling those things as being as though they were. I wish, like Jesus, they would be 310. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but then you, I tell you tomorrow, and, and that now it's 380. But you can't go get 310. You just got to deal with it. You, just got, you got it for 310. Don't get mad. Just go. You, got, you need gas. Get what you can get. Just because it changed don't mean that you still can't make it. As a matter of fact, God knew that you could handle 380 and that I needed 310. That boy ain't ready for 380. You see? He ain't ready for 380. He's a 310 right now. He's a 310 lifestyle. So let's give him 310 so don't kill him. That's why the Bible tells us not to covet, not to envy, not to be jealous because God knows how to get all of us through with the strength, the strength that he's given us, the fortification that he's given you. He knows how much your mind can take. He knows how much strength you have. I've used the analogy. Some of you are all newer, and I'll use it again. My daughter likes it because it's a real analogy. Everyone in here has a key in their pocket to a car. Everyone has a key, or you sit beside a person with a key. Everyone here has an apartment key or a house key on them or someplace that you live or you're sitting with the person that has the key or you're with them. Here's the deal. How many of you know that attached to every key is a price? It might be paid for, but we already talked about property tax. If you live in Virginia, you're still going to pay. They don't even care if you own it. You, it's paid for. So what? Still send us $200. <laughs> Makes no sense. But anyways... How many of you know that there's, everybody's got an apartment, but if it, with an apartment comes rent? If you got a car key on you, say amen. How many know that every car payment typically comes with a payment? How many of you know that some of y'all are not ready to switch keys with some people in the room? I handed my wife my key earlier. You know, I got a new car recently. I work around the car business. I make sure that I do as much as I can strategically to get as many benefits and discounts as I can. So I actually am licensed to sell cars at a car dealership that I don't work at. But I get all the discounts. Thank you, Jesus. That make you want the Holy Ghost. So how do you do that? It was a program that they had. So I signed up. Yes, I did. I signed up. So I get all the discounts they give. They give me all the employee discounts. They give me all that stuff. I'd be like, yes. So when I buy my cars, I get the discount. But you still may not want that key. And I may not want your key. I got some friends, some of them are in here. We talk about cars. We like cars. And there's cars that some of us aspire to, to drive. We like, I mean, if you're driving a certain kind of car, again, remember, it's going to come with it, some debt. It's going to come with some maintenance. How many know that everybody's car tires don't cost the same? <laughs> you mess around to get that big truck. <laughs> that big truck, El Sony got them big wheels on it. And when one go out, it's like, they'll be like, excuse me, 450. For what? That's all four? They'll be like, no, that's just one. That's one tire. That's, you, that, you got, you're getting one tire for 450. You're getting one tire. I saw a, a video yesterday, and it was a car. The tire was as wide as both my legs double. It was on the Bugatti. And then they had an AMG tire, which comes off of a Mercedes car. An AMG from whichever Mercedes that was off. It was the tires, just the tires. I would imagine that that one tire from the Bugatti has to cost at least $1,200 to, to $2,000 per tire. So you can get enamored with all that stuff. Remember, everything comes with a cost. So you think she's so pretty. You better check her lifestyle. <laughs> she fine? Well, she fine. Oh, I like the way she walk. Okay. It's going to cost you. I like the way she talk. Mm, there's a price on that, too. <laughs> I like the way her fingernails look and her hair look. Well, you're going to be a part of that too soon if you go talk to her. If you're going to take care of you're going to be a blessing to her, you know, not take care of her because she can buy all this stuff herself, I'm sure. But when you get married to her, you got to feel love and you want to give her opportunities. Yeah, well, you paid for You bought that before you got there. Same with him. He over there, he's like, honey, what would you like for birthday? Oh, I want to get an ATV. What? And I want to get myself a jet ski. What? You got to ask these people what they like before you marry them. <laughs> That's around to marry somebody with expensive taste. All they want to eat is filet mignon. It's like, no, I don't eat that other stuff. What do you like? I just like steaks. <laughs> my daddy raised us on steaks. See, you like, my daddy raised us on oodles and noodles. We ain't about to, we ain't about to get, we can get some steak flavored oodles and noodles. But we, 
We ain't about to get no real steak. <laughs> Not today. We'll get that steak flavor and sauce and throw it in there. <laughs> no real steaks. Not today. <laughs> Anybody got those kind of problems? Don't raise your hand. Keep your eyes straight forward. <laughs> I don't have those problems. My wife, we agree on stuff. We spend together. We, we got a good life. Neither one of us are overkill on anything. Not really. We like, is she talking behind my back? <laughs> If it were, Janice, it would be me. <laughs> Baby, let's buy that. I got some friends like that in here I, and, and, and in this community. They just like that. Let's, let's get this. I do try to get it on sale, though, Pastor Fred. I do. I got coupons in the car right now, 10% off at Dillard's. Yes, I do. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Valentine's Day coming up. I got to get my wife something nice. I like going to Dillard's. I mean, that's like one of the only shopping places we can go around here. I got to go there, but I need 10%. And I ask him, is there any more discounts when I go? Is there anything else I can get? I'm a good customer. I come here all the time. You know what I'm saying? Valentine's Day. Jay's birthday on February the 8th. My mother's on the 12th. I need some stuff. But I need a discount. Yes, I do. I got to get a discount because I like to go shopping. If you like to go shopping, you better have a lot of money or some discounts. Or both. <laughs> My wife said both. That's good. Have a lot of money and discounts. That way you can keep your money when you get the discount. How many of y'all know how to shop with coupons? I know, I know Pastor Gladys, she's like a, one of the king, queens at it. I mean, some, and I know some of y'all can go shopping and pay a nickel for a whole carton full of, um, cart full of stuff. That's a miracle. But use it to your advantage. I was talking to one of our elders one day, and she was talking about we're using the Amer we have American Express cards and all. And she said, this is the one that gives you all these benefits. I was on the phone asking her some questions. And I said, so what do you do? She said, this card, switch that one to this one. Because you get all the, all the rewards with this one. That'll pay for this, this, and this. We just took a trip to this place, and we stayed in this hotel that cost $400 a night. We got it for $80 a night. I'm like, which card is that? Send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> the way, the truth, and life. Remember, experiences. I'm still talking about wisdom. I'm still talking about wisdom. I'm still talking about your ability to, to uphold up under the, the cares of, of this life. My daughter likes this statement. I mean, not... not Say it because some of you all that are newer never heard it. Talked about all the keys. And someone once said, if I throw my keys to you and you're not ready, please duck. In other words, there's some people in here with a nice car on their ring, a nice house and mortgage on the ring, a nice this, 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 and this on the key ring. If they toss it to you, move. You can look at your kids and just say, here, you want these keys? When your kids acting up at the house? Getting all bad, he's 14 now, he's sticking his chest out. Got a little fuzz on his lip. Start to talk like a man, voice deeper than yours now. Hey, daddy. You're like, boy, you better take that bass out your voice. I guarantee you ain't going to make it if you keep talking like that. But yeah, daddy, so I think I need the car. You don't need the car, boy, you're 14, you ain't getting the car. I'm almost ready. You need to sit down. You ain't about to get the car. Well, sit down before I knock you down, boy. Sit down. And, but he got it, and then you just take the keys. You hold him up, and he think he can handle them. Kids swear they can handle your keys. They swear they could run that house without you. I could do this better than you. You could? Here, take one key. I'm going to give you just this one key. This is the key to the house. I'm going to need you to take care of all the mortgage, all the insurance, all the maintenance, anything that goes wrong, heater, air conditioner, anything that goes wrong with the plumbing, Anything that might go wrong on the foundation. I'm going to need you to deal with anything that goes on in any aspect of this house. I'm going to be back in one year. Do not lose my stuff. You 16, you bad. You know we ain't about to do that. Because wisdom says that's a fool's move. <laughs> you know, good and well, that house will be toe up from the floor up. Because they're not ready. They think they're ready. They're walking around with this life that's emerging. they feeling grown. They're starting to like girls, and, and they're starting to feel like they got muscles and, and everything, but you broke. <laughs> Can't take care of a thing. Pastor Kel called me early. He was taking care of something. Kids are growing just like mine. One had a situation with the car. He had to go take care of it. He said, Pastor, I'm going to be a little behind. Got to go take care of a car situation. We took care of one the other day. Car got towed. Jesus. And they always call it, the call is mommy, daddy. My car just got towed. Well, where is it? Go get it. <laughs> you need 250 for me? <laughs> I always need my 125. <laughs> get your own 125 out and go get your car out of impound. 
<laughs> how many of you know that happens? And how many of you know if you don't got the money to get out of the impound, they charge you daily? That's adulting. Somebody say adulting. Kids ain't ready for the keys. They ain't ready for the keys. And some of y'all are not ready for the keys. Stop covering other people's ministries. You ain't ready. I'd be a better leader in that ministry than she is. Oh, 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 oh. You can't carry the weight. Let me show you the keys that are in that. You want to handle the members now. And every one of the members in here is a key, but then they carry multiple keys within the key that they are. So now you got this wonderful brother, Mike, and I are good friends. We talk all the time. We joke each other. We have fun. We're serious. We love each other. We look out for each other. If I see him in the community, we say, we're friends. We're going to be friends on the level that we can be. He liked Washington. I like Dallas. We both losing. <laughs> We both on the couch. He was on the couch first, so he saved a seat on the couch for me. So now I'm sitting beside him, about to watch the other teams go. One for my division. I'm a little salty. Pray for me right now while I get focused again. Thank you, Jesus. Get myself back on track. But every member is a key for a leader to, to manage, to help them. And within every member is keys, multiple keys. And you think that you can handle the, the women, the, 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 the couple's ministry. You can't. You, you think you can handle the student ministry. You can't. You're not ready for all the parents that come with the children, that come with the stuff that's on the inside of each one of them. You're not ready yet. And God is protecting you. You're, you're in the back of the line, not because the back of the line is, the, is, is because for people who are not ready. It's just that you're back there because God knows you ain't ready. So he put me on the front of the line. Moses, going first. He sent in Joshua and Caleb and, and 10 other men before that just to spy it out to see if it was capable to be lived in. And they, some of them came back scared to death. It's giants in the land. We can't do nothing in there, but not Joshua and Caleb. Caleb was like, give me my mountain. Joshua was like, I got some plans over there. I'm going to build me a house right there on that one. And so some of you are not ready to lead God's people. So stop thinking because some people make it look easy that you can do what they do. You can't. And it's not because you won't be able to, you're just not ready yet. And it's not that anyone that's doing it is better than you. It's just that you, if Mike was, again, Mike and I never had any difficulty, and I hope that we never do. But sometimes you got to lead people who give you difficulty. Let's use, you know, say, you know, we talk about sports and, and everything, but say that it got a little more intense. He said something about me that I found out about. Now I got to figure out if I want to stand right here and preach. And be so kind in front of him or, or say, there's a brother in this church. Ha, sha, ba, 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 ba. He normally wear a, a black pea coat and brown shoes with tassels. Ha, ba, 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 ba. Today he might be sitting on a road next to a sister in a red sweater. <laughs> but this brother ain't nobody. He, he a backbiter. He's a, he's a heathen, you know. And he'd be like, everybody be like, it's him. <laughs> He got like a brass medallion around his neck today. He's a black man. <laughs> About 61, 2, 3, or 4, somewhere in there. If y'all see him, tell him I don't like him. <laughs> Some preachers do that. They weren't ready to lead yet. They still take his stuff too personal. <laughs> they still too immature. Still not ready. You can't, you can't be tempted by things in church. You can't be tempted by the opposite sex and fall to that. You got to be strong. You can't, you can't put yourself in predicaments where you can't, you're, not, you're not ready for that. You think you are, but you're not ready. You can't put yourself in. You can't be talked about. Somebody talk about your family member. You're ready to fight. Go up to the church and fight them. Leaders can't do that. Good shepherds don't fight the flock. They lead the flock. You can't go hating them. You got to love them. And God's got to put that in you because it ain't always easy to deal with the keys in the people. Never said it like that before, but every key represents a different attitude, a different posture, a different disposition. It's 11. Last one. Mike, you know we're going, even though that Washington thing is a little bit on my nerve. I know my Dallas thing on your nerves too. But guess what? We both at the crib just watching TV. <laughs> Well, the Washington's over here, Washington fans. Hell, to stop that. Is Cindy in here today? She not in here. Good. Okay. Her sister likes Dallas, and they like, she likes Washington. They be going at it every week. Family feud. <laughs> the Hatfields and the McCoys right in the crib. <laughs> 
They got the last laugh this year. That's okay. It's, they don't pay us to do none of this. Amen. I like to fuss with my friends about it. We just go back and forth like we getting paid about the football. <laughs> no, I'm telling you. No, you don't know. Come on, think about it this way. Man, keep your eyes on your weights. <laughs> I am the true vine. All right. Again, back in those days, and when I grew up, my grandparents, my dad's side, at both sides, they had uh, grape vines in the backyard. V- vines, it was just, we had, oh man, just grapes everywhere. Pl- plums, these different type of plums, apple trees, peach trees, um, just bl- blackberries, and just uh, all sorts of uh, fruit and, and, uh, and vegetables too. But in Israel, vineyards was a central part of the life and the economy of Israel. All right. A part of their use in wine, grapes uh, played an equally uh, important role uh, in the diet of the Palestinians as well as the uh, Israelis. They're right there together. And so as we found from uh, the other I am statements, Jesus was not introducing something new. It was something familiar to every listener. So whenever you're listening to what God is saying, it's familiar to you. When I start talking about those keys, it's familiar to you. I took a, a, a parable or I took this I am statement and broke it down in a modern day parable, as it were, because every one of us understands what the key ring is. It gives us access to things, but every key has responsibility on it. Amen. And so we, 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 we look at this and we understand that it's familiar to the listener. All right. The uh, centrality of vineyards to the Jewish life is this. A comparison of Jesus, listen to this, centrality in our lives. He is the center of our faith. So while vineyards was central to them, they have vineyards. When I was there in Israel, I saw lots of vineyards. And and, uh, if you go like up north towards um, uh, Massachusetts and this country and and Maine, and even here in Williamsburg, there's a, a, a vineyard and a winery and different places where they have wineries and vineyards, you can see the, 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 the intricate growth pattern. You can see, like with my grandparents, they had a, a metal uh, piping system that they put in the ground, and the vine- vines grew up over that, and they, they expanded, and they made sure that it had um, a trellis so that the, the vines could continue to expand and grow. And you can get under it the way they designed it. We could get under it and, and get shade, be under there. But if you got under there, you had to deal with what was under there, Bees, snakes, uh uh, frogs, other things would be trying to get grapes too. They're trying to eat too. Other insects, yeah, birds all over the place. So whenever you're going to deal with the centrality of life, there's always going to be opposition to the centrality of your life. So in other words, Jesus is the vine. He's the center. But there are going to be other things, watch this, (laughs) beckoning for your attention, fighting you from being focused on Christ. He's the true vine. We're grafted into him. We grow in him. But there's going to be those things that challenge your focus. There's always going to be competition for your attention. The devil doesn't want you focused on Jesus. He wants your brain to be, and my brain to be scattered. He wants us to think about um, a multitude of things that have nothing to do with our growth and development in Christ. All right? If Jesus is the true vine, the implication is that there are false vines that we can or may be connected to. So Jesus said, I am the true vine, which again, again gives the implication that there potentially can be false vines. You don't want to get connected to things that don't give you sustenance. In other words, every grape that we ever took off the vine that was delicious and good stayed connected to the vine. You understand that? In other words, there there was no option for these grapes that we're talking about that I grew up with and you grew up with to have a false vine. So if you got a grape off the thing and it was good and and succulent and juicy and delicious, it was as a result of it being connected to the vine. Of course, once it fell off the vine, it would do what? Rot. All right. We just stay connected so that we don't become rotten. We stay perpetually connected to the vine. But don't get connected to the wrong sources people that are teaching wrong religious principles. Don't be reading information that is diluting scripture. Bishop was teaching the other day on uh, biblical translations. The NIV, 
the Message Bible, all the various ones. The one uh, that he recommends and I recommend, King James Version. Can't go wrong because of the stateliness of it, because of the, as he said, the beauty of it, because of the succinct order of it, because of the, 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 um, the um, readability of it that challenges you. In other words, when you read it, it makes you think outside of the norm where we have these Bibles that are translated to be in modern day vernacular. Doesn't mean that they're wrong translations, but we want to stick to the one that's closest to the original, to the Septuagint. We want to stick to the one that's closest to the original writings. Why? So that we can have a great foundation. Because people sometimes in translation leave out words that mean different things. Or words, they might sub substitute a word that means something totally different than what it meant in the Greek or the Latin. So you have to know that. You have to study to show yourself approved. So stick close. And then one that I, would, I use a lot, I believe that I've, I think Bishop Macbeth gave it to us. He gave a lot of us a Bible one day years ago. He's a good friend of ours. And he said, here, I got a Bible for everybody. It's an English Standard Version. It's good. It's written in more of a modern day vernacular, but it sticks close to the foundation of what the King James Bible is as a foundation. And so we want to be careful of reading bad translations. We want to be careful of getting caught up with people on TV who are teaching things about church that are inaccurate. Stick close to home so that you don't stray far away. Let me say that again. Stick close to home so you don't stray far away. I'm not stopping, cannot stop anyone from liking any preacher, but don't go far. Don't start eating at places that you don't know who's cooking. Yeah, don't eat, a, spiritually especially. I mean, we're going to eat at restaurants all the time. You don't know who's in the kitchen. But spiritually, it's detrimental when you're eating at a lot of places and you don't really know who's cooking. Because gifts and everything that looks so wonderful to you and the sound and the preaching style, that has, may have nothing to do with the word that's being sown into you. You know, people on TV watching the one man, he's always, ain't it right? I ain't going to say his name because he don't even want nobody to know his name, so go look for him. No, he's just so wrong. Ain't it right? No, ain't it wrong? Be quiet. I hear lying to people, setting up people's homes for destruction, you know, and, 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 and so many out there are just not teaching the scripture, not teaching the word, not teaching foundational the truth that will make you free. A word that will hold us accountable to what we do, a word that will hold us accountable to God, a word that will hold us accountable to one another. Amen. And so that's the truth that we want. And we're going to stay with the vine. Amen. And amen. If God said anything to you today at any point during this service, whether it be worship or through the word, give him some praise. Come on. Let's give him some praise. Amen. Amen. Today at two o'clock over at Liberty, my friend Apostle Chris Spells, we're doing it again, working along with, uh, let me see if I can open this up. We're having a prayer vigil today at two over at um, Liberty. Liberty Baptist Church in Newport News, right? Or is it Hampton? That's Hampton side. Hampton, they're right by Bethel. And uh, let's see here. So it'll be at 2 o'clock at Liberty Baptist on Bethel, Big Bethel Road. I'm trying to see if I can open up. Mm, here it is. All right. Nope, I don't need that. I need the map. Amen. So if you can come today at the conclusion of our service, it ends our fast. Let's give God some praise for concluding the fast. Oh, come on. Y'all can do. Okay. Amen. Even if you didn't fast with us, give God some praise. Amen. Come on. Let's thank God for, for, for growth in all of our lives because we were praying for everybody. Amen. And so we're going to be there at 2 o'clock at Liberty Baptist Church. I'm trying to see what the address is. Uh, do we have it on the screen? Well, that might not be big enough for everybody to see. Well, there it is in the middle. Uh, where is it at the top? 1021. There it is at the top. Okay, there it is. And you can see some of the pastors. Uh, we can see uh, our special guest, Tiffany Boyle. She's uh, Economic Development in the City of Newport News. And then uh, Pastor Sp Apostle Spells on the right up there on the top. And then you see some of us there in the, in the middle. I'm up there. I'm the one with the big old head right there. In the you got to make fun of yourself sometimes. You know, Keep yourself from being over, overwhelmed. I said, there, I'm the one with the big old head sitting right there. Everybody who laughed, your head big too. <laughs> See? Ah. Yeah, but no, there we are. Amen. This is my friend Kevin Swan, Willard Maxwell, all those guys. 
pastor down the middle there. That's Pastor Grant. He's the pastor at Liberty. So on and so forth. Steve Brown, good friend. And so, amen. So we're going to be over there at 2 o'clock. And it'll last probably about an hour and a half. And then we'll be dismissed. But we finish our fast. When I say amen, we're going to be finishing up our fast. Pastors, anything y'all want to share? There's something you want to share? I know there's some announcements. I mean, anything per, yeah, pertaining to what God's done during the fast. We had a great week of prayer. And I want us to thank God for that. Amen. Everybody who was able to attend and come out on the nights, we got we are God's children and we got blessed by God every single time. Thanks for everyone who participated and those who participated even further, praying and doing other things during the services. Amen. If you're here today and are thinking about a relationship with Jesus and you've never made a commitment, the commitment would be, you know, I'm going to become a Christian. I'm not quite sure how that works. I'm not quite sure, you know, how to do it, but I would like to. And so I want to just extend an invitation to someone, anyone. If you're here today and want to become a Christian and you've been thinking about it and you don't really know where to place it in your thought process because part of you saying, nah, I ain't ready for that. And another part of you saying, it's impossible for me not to be ready. I need to make some changes. If, if you're here and maybe you've been going through that perplexing cycle of to do it or not to do it, then maybe today is the day. Maybe it is, but it'll have to be your choice, of course. I just want to extend this invitation to say that there's no reason to wait. The only reason to wait is because you fail to understand the reality. And the reality is this, is that when you make a choice for, for Christ, it does change your life. But if it doesn't work for you, you don't have to keep doing it. I tell people that all the time. You can stop doing it, but why not give it a chance? especially if the things that you're doing aren't working the way you thought they should. Why not give it a chance? In essence, what do you have to lose? Well, there's a lot to lose, but maybe you don't understand that, so I won't get into that. There's a lot to lose, and I will say this much, starting with our eternity with him. But so many things in between that from the decision. So if you make a decision for Jesus today, whether you're online or whether you're in the sanctuary, it will make a difference in your life. So I'm going to ask by a show of hands, if there's someone in the sanctuary, if there's someone online that wants to do it, you can just say it's me or yes in the comments, and we'll try to identify that and and make a record of it. But if, if you're in the sanctuary and want to give your heart to Jesus, you just simply want to just raise your hand because, listen, you're making the decision to try something that you think you need to do. So if you're here this morning and you want to give your heart to Jesus, I want you to indicate that by just simply raising your hand and we're going to pray with you. Anyone that wants to do that. Sir, ma'am, younger, older, if you want to do it, just raise your hand. And God is already prepared to receive you to himself. It's my responsibility. Where? Oh, back there. Good. Good. A younger person. Amen. Stand up back there. From the youngest to the eldest, God is saving. Stand up. Whoever raised their hand. I can see somebody kind of like blocking. They will stand up. Good. Right there. Let's give God praise. (laughs) Hallelujah. If there's someone else, this is an, uh, an amazing opportunity for you as well. I'll give one more. Yeah. That's good. And stand up. Stand up right here. Yeah. You know what? No, you stay right there. You don't have to come. <laughs> and I hate to say I knew, but I was really feeling a draw towards you. Not because, because he's a young person. I didn't expect him to be saved. But I just really felt that that was the thing that was going to happen. Amen. If both of y'all will continue to stand, let's stand. We stand again. And we're going to pray together with you. But pray this, these words. Because this is basically how it works. It's like, uh, you know, anything else that we subscribe to you know at the end of every at the end of everything that you sign up for online they have a check box that says do you agree with the the terms y'all y'all seen those and you check the box and it allows you to proceed and to click on and open up whatever app or whatever um, service that you have signed up for well this is how we check off the box we make a a, a declaration in our hearts and with our mouths one that says that we believe Jesus. And so 
It's simple, and everybody that's born again in this room has done it in a similar fashion, maybe not exactly the same, but in a similar fashion, but it said what is necessary. And here's what's necessary to be said. And we're going to ask you all to, to pray with this. And you can bow your head because we're going before God. And you can say these words back there and up here in the front. Lord Jesus, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, right now, I ask you to come into my life to save me. Forgive me of my sin and make me whole. Right now, I believe in my own heart that this is right for me. And out of my own mouth, I declare that you are my Savior and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> come on, church. All of heaven rejoices over one soul. Come on, come on. We have two wonderful people, young people, back here, right here, that are giving their hearts to the Lord. Amen and amen. Right here we have, this is Elder Tony, and this is Elder Lewis is going to be coming back there. This is just some information. We just want to greet you and uh, we want to get some information from you briefly, just some general information. And back here, there's someone coming to, to greet you and to meet with you. Amen. 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 Pastor Fred's going to come now with a couple of things. Uh. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. That is definitely worth celebrating again and again and again. Amen. Well, this is our first Sunday together. And so if there are any birthdays and anniversaries, if you could just raise your hand for a moment. Birthdays and anniversaries for the February babies and February couples. All right. All right. Praise God. Let's give God a praise offering for them. This, year, this is your month, and you can celebrate. All right. Awesome, awesome. Do we have any first-time guests here with us this morning for the first time? All right. God bless you right there, sister. Amen. Amen. Were you able to get a gift bag as well? Awesome, awesome. Amen. All right. Yes, sir. You clean too, brother. I appreciate that right there. Yes, sir. You got a gift bag as well. All right. Awesome. Awesome. God bless you for being here and just being sensitive to the leading of the Lord to lead you here to fellowship with us this morning. And we trust and believe that God will continue to bless you, to increase you and show his favor over your life. Amen. And everyone that you're connected with also. Hallelujah. Whew, man, I'm full right now. I'm just so excited. I'm trying to move on. But man, two, two souls coming into the kingdom. That's just, that's just good news right there. That just blesses my heart. And two, and two, a young man and a young man. Yes. Come on, the streets is not going to kill them, somebody. We've declared and made a stand, and God has proven himself today that they should live and not die. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. God's got a purpose for them. And that young fellow back there raised his hand first boldly, said, I'm not afraid. I understand what's going on right here. Let me get on up in here real quick, like. All right, we're going to get to the announcements. We're going to get out of here. So uh, we do want to let you know also um, on next Friday, all right, next Friday. What's happening, Friday? All right. Um, somebody else want to rededicate their life? Go ahead, try it. Check it out. Put that right here. If, if, if you've been a believer, but you struggled and kind of fell away from God and not in that place that you were before in relationship time, it's okay. We go through seasons like that in life, and you're not to be ashamed of that. But if you're here today and you feel just the urging and the nudging of the Holy Spirit to say, you know what, I just want to make sure that I'm on the path that God is leading me. Can you raise your hand for a moment? Because we don't want to rush through this. I know, I know we're breaking the fast, and, and you're going to get to eat, and restaurants will be there, but there's nothing more important than the soul being saved. And so if you're here today, I don't want you to feel like it's, 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 it's churchy, it's religious, but no, just if you can just raise your hand so we can pray with you if you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. And even being online, all right, if you're being online, like Apostle mentioned earlier, put a yes or that's me in the comment section so we can connect with you. 
Hallelujah. Amen. So on next Friday, we do want to let you know something so exciting. Cornerstone Worship Center International will be participating and supporting a night's welcome again. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. So a night's welcome is where we partner for this year. We're partnering with another ministry, and I'll give you that here in a moment, to really serve and help our homeless community. Amen. So we'll be serving them food. There will be some um, blankets and things that will be given. But also, this is a great opportunity for you to serve and to share what the Lord has done with you over the reading, John, these 21 days, and then these seven days that we fasted together to share what the Lord has spoken to you and how good God has been to you. Amen. To dust off that testimony. Yes. Come on, somebody. Yes. This is a great opportunity. So Friday, the 10th, from 5 to 8 p.m., all right, our point of contact, our point of contact here is Sister Felicia Walker. Some of y'all know us as Fifi. Raise your hand. All right, that's Sister Fifi right there, Sister Felicia. She's our point of contact if you're interested in serving. So that's next Friday, the 10th, from 5 to 8. And the location is going to be at Calvary Reformed Presbyterian Church. And that's here at Hampton. All right, that's here in Hampton. Amen. A great opportunity to come in and serve. Hallelujah. And last but not least, we do want to let you know, on um, last Tuesday, an email went out um, regarding giving statements, um, and we had a little um, technical issue with tidally connecting um, the necessary statements and whatnot, and we know about that, and we're working to remedy that. Uh, but in the meantime, Sister Keona Wardrette will be out in the foyer in the kiosk for, with some giving statements um, for those who've desired to receive one. And so please see her immediately after the service for the giving statements. Amen? Amen. Amen. We appreciate you. God bless you. I'm going to turn it over to the apostle. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Fred. Let's all stand in the presence of the Lord because service is concluding right now. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you to our guests that are here. God bless you. Hope that uh, we uh, have been able to fellowship together effectively. I believe we have. And we look forward to meeting you again if possible. Also, to those who have given their heart to the Lord, congratulations. Congratulations. I believe this is that's Elder Hart's grant grandson, Elder Hart's grandson back there in the back, one of our elders whose son, grandson just gave their heart to the Lord. But everyone's important, everyone, whether they're related to someone we know or not. Amen. Well, if you're able to join us over at Liberty at 2 uh, p.m., do so. Uh, we thank God for each and every one of you. The fast that we've been on concludes at the conclusion of this prayer. When I say amen, you can shift back. Be careful. Be sure not to jump back into certain things. And uh, if you created a discipline, stick with it. I, I was so glad I told my wife I jumped on the scale this morning. I've been around 204, six, seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there. Today I saw 199. I was, I was like, I said, one, one, it's a one on here. It's a one. So I'm going to try to stay around that one-ish. <laughs> but nonetheless, we all feel better uh, when we fast. It does have benefits. Lord, we thank you and praise you for all that you've done today. Thank you for the work that you've given us to do. Help us to be empowered. And help us to be mindful and focused on getting it done. And we thank you, Lord God, that you are the difference maker. You are the great I am. So whatever is impossible with us is possible with you. And we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for every believer here, every guest, and most importantly, every new believer who just gave their heart to the Lord. We ask that you would help them on their journey. Let us be instrumental in helping them to do so if possible. And we together, Lord God, give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Thank you for the benefits that we've experienced during the fast. And as we move forward, let us continue to build upon that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, God bless you. We'll see you again next time, by God's grace, either later this evening or tomorrow morning on the call or next week for our ministry opportunities. God bless.